set the meeting alight fairly early in the piece when he shattered the track record with this run 30.17 seconds. You know, it's a great track, an up and down course adding interest for the spectators that get a good look of the full journey. That record though only stood a short time as the Bowen of Dwayne Wilson sped the circuit in 30.04. And that's the new record with the pressure now on to break the half minute. The first of the series of stop work meetings was held in Newcastle and Hobart this morning to discuss the latest 30 point offer from employers on the new agreement. Local waterside workers met at Islington in a meeting that was closed to the media. The members voted unanimously to reject the employer's submission and turned their stop work meeting into a 24 hour stoppage. Members were very concerned at the fact that the uh, contract negotiations not only hadn't been finalised, they were due to commence on the 5th of May of this year. But the, uh, in relation to the Federation Log of Claims, there was uh, quite con uh, a amount of concern in relation to the uh, compulsory redundancy answers and also the uh, improvements to the superannuation fund. Uh, the members believe that uh, these are quite outside the uh, accord and should be dealt with entirely within the contract between the employers and the Federation. Further meetings will be held in other major ports around the country, winding up on Thursday in Port Kembla and Sydney. Today's stoppage did not affect coal loading in Newcastle as the Federation has an agreement with the coal trade, but all other vessels in the port are being affected. Local wharfies will return to work at Dog Watch tomorrow morning, but they've urged their Federal Council to take further action to resolve the 1986-88 contract. It's the first time ever negotiations have not been accepted by this time. The Federal Council will meet next week after the stop work meetings have been completed in a bid to have the superannuation and compulsory redundancy issues reviewed by the employers. If they get no satisfaction, local Federation officials say a national stoppage is on the cards. Mr Hills announced the groundbreaking scheme at the Hunter Valley Training Company's Skills Centre at the State Dockyard. The Minister told the audience of employers, union leaders, apprentices and their families that the training company had been set up six years ago when there was a shortage of tradesmen. The company encourages small employers to take on its apprentices for a year. The employer does not have to worry about providing a full four-year apprenticeship, the necessary training or administrative backup. All that is handled by the training company and the concept is now being extended to white collar industry for the first time. At the initiative of the ACTU executive when it met in Newcastle last September, an agreement was reached with the State Labor Council and the Federated Clerks Union. Today Mr Hills, along with the chairman of the training company Milton Morris, Colin Coleman from the Federated Clerks Union and Greg Smith from the Labor Council signed the industrial agreement that ensures this scheme will go ahead. It will be called the Community Training Company and already 24 traineeships have been organised to start on July 1st. With the unemployment rate for Newcastle youth between 15 and 19 years now at 33% and apprenticeships scarce, the Labor Council believes most job opportunities will be in white collar and service industries. Mr Hill says the scheme is an important initiative. It is the first one in Australia of its type. So uh, here in the Hunter Valley uh, we've been able to do a first. Uh, it ensures that uh, young people, particularly young women, are going to be trained uh, in the clerical field so that they're more attractive to employers. The distinctive twin gabled roof of Marthaville has been a feature of Cessnock for more than a century and today locals turned out in force to enjoy the arts, crafts and music that jostled for attention in the historic grounds. Marthaville was built between 1884 and 89 by the town's first mayor George Brown for his wife Martha. It stayed in the family until last year when the owners decided to sell. 
Rumours that the house may fall to the demolisher's hammer rallied a group of locals. They formed the Marthaville Preservation Society and successfully applied for $130,000 in bicentennial funds to buy the house. The society has also received $35,000 from the Heritage Council towards the cost of restoration. Now the society is trying to raise another $15,000 from the public to finish the work by 1988. Five and a half thousand dollars has already been raised and the society is confident that the rest of the money can be found. I think uh, particularly using today's turn up as a guide, I think we'll achieve that goal pretty well by 1988. When restoration is complete, Marthaville will enjoy a new role as an arts and cultural centre for the coalfields. The architectural competition has been jointly sponsored by the Newcastle Master Builders Association and the Kern Corporation's Land Division. Second year architecture students at Newcastle University were asked to design a structure that would reflect the character of Newcastle and serve as a memorable landmark to the new estate. Today this entry was chosen as the winner and its designer Jonathan Evans is now $500 richer after following a few guidelines. Well, it has to be um, able to stand on its own as a landmark and be seen from all the way around and be interesting to people who see it. And it has to, because it's an advertisement for Warrabrook, it has to show some aspects of the Warrabrook estate. Located at Waratah, Waratah, 600, 600 dwellings will eventually be built on the housing estate, as well as a light industrial area and a shopping centre. It's on this site, the entrance to the Warrabrook estate, that the winning design will be built and it's hoped that work will be completed by the end of this year. More than 400 golfers were taking part in the two-day tournament. The annual event began yesterday at the Newcastle course at Stockton and overnight there was a group of four women still in the running, including last year's champion Carol Affleck from Nelson Bay. Today the final 18 holes were played at Steelworks. It's the 55th year the event has been run and competitors had come from as far away as Sydney, Port Macquarie and Armidale for the tournament. The field also included the top women from the Hunter Valley. After the 36 holes, the reigning champion had held onto her crown with a total 166. She finished two shots clear of the runner-up, Meriwether's Doreen Edwards, who they say has played off a handicap of four for 25 years. Third place was taken by another Meriwether golfer, Carolyn Pawley, who was five shots off the pace. most advanced coal carrying vessel in coal and allied industries fleet. Its one man operation of the bridge controls, coal discharger and ballast system makes the Wallara unique in Australia. Today leaders in the coal and transportation industries were invited to inspect the coal carrier and meet her crew. Captain Robin Blackmore said that the Wallara's advanced technology makes it the pride of coal and allied's fleet. She sure is. She's a uh, modern fast self-discharging vessel uh, designed to go from Catherine Hall Bay to Newcastle and she's, she's the pride of Colin Allied fleet. The showpiece of the vessel is the bridge which can be entirely operated by one man. Visitors today including the State Minister for Transport and Acting Premier Ron Mulock were shown over the streamlined equipment for steering and docking the ship, activating the coal discharger and operating the ship's 16 ballast tanks. Visitors were captivated by the view from the bridge and the electronic view offered via the ship's radar. The ship is powered by two turbocharged diesel engines generating 3,000 kilowatts of power enabling her to travel at a normal speed of 14 knots per hour. 
Of course, the Wallera's most unique feature is its ability to unload its own cargo at the touch of a button from the bridge. The discharging boom arm weighs 36 tonnes, and when fed by a conveyor belt operating at 6 metres per second, it takes just over two hours to discharge an average load of 5,500 tonnes of coal. The two cargo holds are lined with Teflon tiles, another unique feature of the ship. The tiles speed up the coal slipping through to the conveyor belt below the cold 16 gates. The Wallera will begin its regular daily run between Catherine Hill Bay and Newcastle this Thursday. Got in right in behind that end. The flat was well alight and smoke logged when they arrived. The fireman fought the blaze back to find the woman trapped and unconscious in the bedroom at the rear. Completely smoke logged. You just couldn't see a foot in front of you. Uh, and I had to get this on. And, uh, even with this on, I couldn't get past the fire before we could knock it down a bit. Until so, we... so how did you find the woman? When did you get to the woman who was well, murdered? The... the woman after, well, in, I'd say within about five or six minutes after we knocked the fire down so we could get through. She, we, was, she was trapped by the fire? Yeah, she was trapped in the room by the fire and she's, she's sort of gone and sat down in the corner. Her flat was one of two in the weatherboard cottage. The kitchen and lounge room areas were governed by fire and there was extensive smoke and fire damage in the bedroom. At this stage, firemen believe the fire may have started in a refrigerator in the kitchen. This would have blocked any access from the land to the exit. Mrs Richardson was rushed to Belmont Hospital and then transferred to the Royal where her condition is listed as satisfactory. Police and firemen are still investigating the incident. Over the last two days, the cream of the state's schoolboy rugby league players have been showing off their talent in selection trials at Toronto's Peacock Field. Many talent scouts from the Sydney clubs were on hand, checking out any potential stars. After various regional selection games, four teams representing country areas and the Sydney metropolitan area were left in the running. In the final game today, Northern in the Green played Metropolitan. The Northern side featured seven local players and scraped home 24-19 in an exciting game. On that form, it was not surprising that the New South Wales team announced this afternoon included eight Northern players. Three locals, Michael Erickson of Taree, Terry Dolan of Glendale and Ashley Gordon of Cardiff were amongst the selections. The team goes to the Australian Schoolboy Championships in Queensland in August and those who make the Australian side will tour England in November. situations like this that worry workers and management at the power station. A seriously injured man lies hurt on a catwalk way above the ground. It was for that reason that the management organised a week of training and today's rescue exercise for their first aid team. Over 1,000 people work at the power station, which is the second largest fully operational station in the valley. There are a variety of sites where the employees work and also a variety of dangers. Well, Vales Point Power Station is fairly isolated from the major centres and the size of the place, but plus the type of situations that are around here, it is fairly important that they have some on-site first aid and rescue training program to be able to recover people from different situations. The sooner we can get somebody with proper training to an injured person, the better is going to be the final outcome. Jerry DeVries is one of two ambulance rescue instructors in the state and it's been his job to train the first aid team in basic rescue techniques. Today's rescue exercise was a realistic mock-up of a possible drama.
Sitting ready for action from today is the Sydney Rescue Helicopter Service's backup machine, a squirrel equipped with night sun and winch. It fills the gap between the end of the lease of this Bell Long Ranger and the arrival of a new aircraft which has been purchased for the Newcastle service. The decision to buy a rescue helicopter for the Hunter was taken a year and a half ago, when the leased machine used at the time, a Jet Ranger, was abruptly recalled. To prevent the same thing happening again, a public appeal has been underway to raise the half million dollars necessary to buy one. We had an appeal launched a couple of years ago, approximately uh, two years ago. It has raised $420,000. Now that has gone to make up the 550000 total for the new helicopter. So we're, uh, the uh, balance of that we actually borrowed ourselves through uh, Westpac. Uh, what we now require is uh, for the community to become involved or continue to be involved in the helicopter service and uh, we look at around about a shortfall of $120,000 each year that uh, we feel is, uh, should be coming from the community. So the new and permanent Newcastle Rescue Helicopter will be in service within a month, carrying the sponsorship of Westpac 2HD and MBN, and a fourth major sponsor to be announced soon. The state government says it wants to introduce new measures to improve coordination between the three primary emergency services, the police, the ambulance and fire brigade. While the police are taking the measures to improve the community control of the state emergency services disagrees. The committee says police already have the final say and that the problem is which services and how many should respond to an emergency call. In the Hunter, the ambulance service says cooperation and coordination already exists. We uh, have our separate roles to play. The ambulance mandate, of course, is to look after sick and injured people. And the uh, fire people, uh, obviously their first priority is, is fires, and uh, they also carry rescue, of course, but their first priority is fires. And, um, of course, the police have the overall task of rescue. And uh, I think when... Uh, everybody cooperates, there isn't really a duplication of service. Does the rivalry which seems to exist between the three services in Sydney also exist in the Hunter? No, I don't believe it does. I'm very pleased to say that there's intense cooperation between the three principal services, rescue services in the Hunter, and this has always been so. The police in Newcastle seem to agree. A spokesman for the department says the police already have the primary responsibility for controlling and coordinating rescue operations, except at the scene of a fire where the senior fireman is automatically in charge. Halakalani Club is on the central coast near Budgie Wall and is a Polynesian word meaning heavenly place and it was today for the male of the species as the man, Alan Baker of Grand Views Club in Sydney prevailed over the lady, Dorothy Roach of Rose Hill also in Sydney. Baker finally won after some superb lawn bowls put on by two champions. Baker is a state player and former state singles champion and he needed that experience to beat Dorothy Roach, a former twice state champion and a national champion too, herself a gold medalist from the World Bowls. The tournament includes the club champion, the Central Coast champion and ten invited men that this year included Newcastle players Barry Salter and Terry McCabe and four ladies, all champions too, in Betty Bradley, Rosemary O'Brien and Joyce Fitzpatrick. Baker upheld the male honour 31 to 25. You beaut, we remain confident at least till next year. In speaking to the 70 delegates today, Sir Lawrence Street said that the court system as it operates in our society is a precious resource which is essential to a free democracy. He's concerned, however, that the system is becoming blocked up and inefficient through overuse. He said there are now three legal alternatives to settling disputes via the courts, and these alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, as the Chief Justice described them, will help to preserve the efficiency of the judicial system. 
Richard Anisish, a Newcastle solicitor and chairman of the Young Lawyers section of the Law Society, replied by saying that clients today are demanding a more efficient and less costly way of resolving disputes. As an example, he said that commercial clients in Newcastle now face an 18-month delay between consulting a solicitor and receiving a date for hearing in court. Lawyers in attendance seemed most concerned with the threat to their profession in being the sole providers of conveyancing services. When asked if he thought solicitors were best able to handle conveyancing in New South Wales, the Attorney General Terry Sheen replied that the answer now was yes, but computer technology was beginning to change this. He conceded that conveyancing was extremely important financially, especially to country lawyers, but that lawyers may have to accept a changing role in conveyancing matters in the future. The conference will continue tomorrow.